talk that I'll be giving now, the third third talk actually, but the second subject on the Four Noble Truths. So I was preparing that over the past couple of weeks. Um, and as I went through it, I knew ahead of time that the Four Noble Truths is a very central and important subject, but it really occurred to me, this is such a broad subject. It connects to so many things uh, that really, even if we go through two talks, which I think it will definitely take two talks, uh, it's really only going to be an introduction to some of the debates and the major points here. Um, this is, I think, the most important subject in all of, of uh, the Parchin studies. Now, maybe I said the same thing about the bodhicitta. Uh, and it, I guess the reason I would say that about bodhicitta is that it's the heart of the Mahayana path. But in terms of something that condenses so many of the major points that come up again and again in, in the eight chapters of the Abhisamaya Lamkara, then uh, the Four Noble Truths is going to be... Um, yeah, I can't hear you. There's a message from you here. It says, I can't hear... Can you not hear me? Yeah, I can't hear you. Um, so... Uh, yeah, let, type a message if you need something. Okay, we have technical problems. We need five minutes. Okay. So should I should I pause for five minutes? Yes. Okay. The reason I don't hear you, it may be an issue that I'm using a microphone that Venerable Lecce had given me. It's not headphones with a with I don't have a a audio coming in. Last time what I what happened is I was just listening to the computer audio, but it doesn't seem to be broadcasting any sound Hi. this time. Can you hear us? Now I can hear you, yes. I someone just said, Can you hear us? And I heard that. Yes. So apparently the microphone was mute. Okay, okay, good. Next time I'm I'm getting a new microphone that I ordered, so that will have a audio for me also earphones, and uh, should work better. Okay. But this microphone that Lexia gave me is a very high quality, so hopefully you can hear me well. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. I think sure. the problem sure. was at our end. Okay. So, um, okay. I think. Okay, so if you could bear with us, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Take your time. There, there's lots of running around going on behind okay. me. Take can't... your time. We're we're just sitting here. It's a nice rainy evening here in South India. <laughs> okay, now um, I I need to say, ah, uh, um, okay. Voglio fare una domanda alla chat in italiano. I want to ask the chat something in Italian. Bear with me one second. Allora, gli italiani non c'è l'opzione di interpretazione, non, non c'è, non potete collegare con l'italiano. Come si sente bene l'italiano? Si vede bene. Qualcuno mi può scrivere nella chat, siete collegati all'interpretazione italiano? Yes, we are. Okay. Okay. Is that Davide? Oh, new messages. Okay, it's working. Okay. okay. Allora, chiedo pazienza a tutti un attimo, grazie. Sì, si sente bene l'italiano. Ah, 
Sì, allora, ehm, vorrei chiedere ehm, una cortesia. Le persone a casa, se non eh, state parlando, potete per favore spegnere il microfono, eh, metterlo a muto. Grazie. Ok. Would you like me to begin talking again? Not just yet. Not just yet, ok. Ok. I mean, you can talk. Sorry, that was rude. Everyone's <laughs> laughing at me. I mean, you can talk. Not, not begin the, the lecture. Well, I'll just <laughs> give that. some small talk in the meantime. Okay? okay. <laughs> you have a, a good story to share. Yeah. We're happy to hear well, it. You're all, I'm sure you've all heard that, that North India, at least Delhi, was, was unbearably hot. Yes. Very sadly. But uh, it hasn't been like that here. Everyone thinks it must be hotter in the south, but it's actually yeah. pretty cold down here. Uh, oh, as I said, funny. it's it's been heavy rain, more well, than usual. That, yeah. So you don't have fifty degrees, which must be unbearable. No, no, it's it's not so bad here. It's not hot. It's uh, oh. it's just raining a lot. No, it's normally the rainy season, but I guess it came early this year or something. But they weren't expecting it quite like this, so it was a, not good for the crops. They said. Very good. Everything's, everything's a bit uh, topsy-turvy, I suppose, with the weather here. Yeah. It's everywhere. Well, it sounds like you're quite fortunate. Yeah, we're, we're quite fortunate in, at Sarah. It's it's a bit of a, I don't know, pure land is the right word, but we have the best of everything. It doesn't, it's, Sarah is a bit of an elevation. So no, yeah, South India is notorious for its heat, but Sarah never gets that hot. Wow. And then North India gets very cold in the winter, but yes. doesn't get very cold here. It's always the same temperature every day for, for a month. It never fluctuates day to day. Are you inviting so, us to come stay? Is that what you're saying? Uh, hearing. If, you, if you'd like to learn Tibetan and debate, uh, you're, you're welcome to try. Right. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, it may not be so interesting after after a few days. Right. <laughs> Not a whole lot else to do here other than the Geshe Studies program. Okay, someone is asking a serious question. Okay, what's that? Saying it's the first time I'm participated. Has the lesson already begun? The answer is no. <laughs> no, the lesson has not yet begun. We are practicing the uh, practicing patience while sorting out our technical situations. We are ready. We are ready. Marvelous. Okay. All right. So it seems that we are ready. Venerable, thank you. Venerable, and thank you everybody for your patience. And um, yeah, we rejoice in your good good conditions at Sarah. So we will begin the lesson. Venerable, when you have the slides, um, I was asked if you could make it full screen. When you share the screen, can you make yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did that already. I realized last time. Both okay. talks, actually. I realized at the end of the talk, I realized, though, I hadn't made it the full screen. So I've That's already okay. queued it up that way this time. So it's ready. That's OK. You see the the, the technical yeah. situation we have here. So we're all learning and we're all just right. the best. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, um, I want to thank you, Venerable Gache, very much for being with us to explain this really important topic. And I don't want to take much time, but just to say thank you so much. Venerable Gache has studied a great deal in Sarah, and we're very fortunate to have his wealth of knowledge in explaining maybe what seems a simple topic to us, a topic we think we know, but uh, let's hear what he has to say. So thank you very, very much, Venerable, and over to you. Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll just briefly repeat what I said. 10 minutes ago, in case some people weren't here. So, yeah, as we all know, the Four Noble Truths is is the heart of the Buddhist teachings. Um, but we often think of this as the first turning of the wheel is about the Four Noble Truths, and the second turning of the wheel uh, is about uh, the Mahayana path. So it might not seem that this is the central theme of the second turning of the wheel. However, really, if we study the Abhisamayalamkara and the related commentaries for as we studied them for seven years here at Sarah, uh, or however long you take to study the eight chapters, you'll see that the topics that come up here, the sub, the the themes that come up in the context of the Four Noble Truths, 
are the most central. Uh, uh, all of the main things, like what does it mean to be contam contaminated? And then what does it mean to be a um, uh, under the power of karma and afflictions? What does it mean to be a ripened result? Uh, all of these things are very central. And uh, the in the fourth chapter, in the eighth chapter, in the fifth chapter, uh, they come up all, all over again uh, and in a different way, but you have to know the, the, the central points. Uh, and so I think just doing a few talks on this gives a great introduction to the rest of the the, the subjects. And I, I was saying before that I think, although I may have said that bodhicitta is the, is the heart, is the most important subject in Parnaparamita, I would say, in terms of being the heart of the Mahayana, probably so, but in terms of being the groundwork for understanding all of the concepts that come up again and again, then this is the most important topic. And as you just alluded to, it's not easy at all. Uh, maybe we may make it more difficult to inspire debate, but it also gets to uh, seeing how some of the things that seem so obvious at the beginning uh, are actually not obvious at all. If they were, then probably more people would be having realizations uh, and we wouldn't need to spend so much time uh, putting effort into into understanding all of this. Um, so uh, that being said, without just uh, trying to hype up the topic, I'll just get into it, and then you can see for yourself kind of what I'm talking about. So let's start with the uh, sharing screen here. Okay. So... See, as you see, the Four Noble Truths, the heart of the perfection of wisdom. And here we have the stupa at Sarnath, uh, where the Buddha delivered the first sermon on the Four Noble Truths. So let's start with etymology, as we started last time also. This is often how we begin a topic. So why is it called truth and why is it called noble? Um, so from the point of view of the object, the truths abide in fact just as they are taught, right? So this is the objective side in the sense that these these accord with the way reality functions. And then from the point of view of the subject, meditating on them purifies obscurations. So the understanding here is that by generating a correct understanding of things, then it purifies the wrong views and the imprints of that in the mind uh, through continued meditation. And then in terms of Arya truth or noble truth, uh, they are true for an Arya. That is why it's called noble truth, that Arya beings see them directly as they are. Uh, and then as also said, ordinary beings do not see them. They are still true in reality. So for ordinary, it's not that they don't function for ordinary people. It's just that they don't see it that way. So it's not a matter of it being we sometimes say it's true for me, it's not true for you in the sense of it's a matter of personal opinion. That's not the idea here. It's just a matter of uh, ordinary beings are still affected by this, but aren't able to see it. Um, so there's this quotation from the sutra. Uh, the Buddha says, what Aryas see as happiness, the others, meaning ordinary beings, know as suffering. What others see as happiness, the Aryas know as suffering. So it's inverted. Ordinary beings are attached to ordinary pleasures and uh, averted to ordinary suffering, trying to, as we often say, follow the eight worldly dharmas. Whereas Arya beings see that per, that endless pursuit as uh, endless suffering and uh, see this uh, realization of emptiness as the true happiness, whereas ordinary beings see that as a fearful experience. Oftentimes, emptiness is seen as something to avoid. It's It's Something that maybe, for example, when I searched for pictures of emptiness on the internet for the slide and emptiness, you see pictures of depressed people, right? The sense of emptiness that I, my life is just empty. Uh, but sometimes maybe it, that's actually a good, maybe that's alluding to something that we, when we feel empty, we should go into, we should try to explore that rather than trying to avoid it. But anyway, uh, this is just a small thing on the etymology. So next we have the the difficult points. So these are the main things that I'm going to be focusing on. Um, so I start with a bunch of background information, as I just mentioned, uh, that there are these very important uh, terminology and also just understanding exactly what this term is referring to. 
uh, in terms of these five things, because these are terms that come up again and again. But if we don't really have a clear idea of what they are, uh, then it, it's hard to understand how they work together. So we spend a lot of time debating these, and it's not these aren't things that often have a clear answer. Oftentimes, you have to come up with your your own very personal, and we say shipja in Tibetan, like your uh, very subtle distinction about this is this is this, and it's not that. So we have background information, uh, five of them: contamination, and then afflicted and pure truths, and then ripened effects, samsara, and nature of suffering. And then we have the next two are the are the very central debates. These will take up most of the time. So the first one is order. So why are the four truths presented in the order in which they are presented? And then the 16 aspects and the 16 wrong engagers. Some of you might know that idea that each of the four truths has four aspects that counteract four wrong engagers or four wrong understandings uh, that ordinary beings would hold. And then we have some other debates that are they're more minor, but still uh, quite difficult. So one is our true cessations emptiness. And I think I only have one slide on that. I will just give a brief introduction, but that could take up an entire talk in and of itself. Uh, that's a very major point and a point of disagreement between the Zvadantika and Prasangika Madhyamaka. And then there's a question, is there a common base of true origins and form? So do true origins necessarily mind or can they also be formed? And then there is a common base. Is there a common base of path and true origins? This is a, actually a more difficult debate. This comes up in the Lamrim Chemo. Some of you might have seen. There's a question of our ordinary paths, like the path of accumulation, the path of preparation. Are they true origins or not? And then is there a common base of true paths and persons? Uh, this has to do with this Vajrantika understanding of the mental consciousness being the illustration of a person. So in that case, can it be a true path? And then what true origins do our Zen Arhat still have? This is alluded to uh, in Jitsun Chuki Gelson's commentary in the first chapter, in his commentary on the Four Noble Truths, but he doesn't give any clarity as to what this is. He alludes or sort of implies that Arya, I saw Arhat beings still have true origins of some kind, but doesn't say what they are. So that leaves a lot of room for creativity and then debate about that. So let's start with this. What is contamination? Uh, so uh, first of all, a contaminant, right? The word zakpa in Tibetan, which I think is asvara in Sanskrit, something along those lines. I may be getting a little bit wrong. But anyway, in Tibetan, zakpa, which means to fall. It's a common colloquial word also. Uh, the pen fell out of my hand, zak, zaks, uh, is an affliction. So a contaminant is is synonymous with an affliction. And afflictions are falling in the sense that they you're heavy. A person becomes heavy with afflictions, and it causes them to fall into samsara. So that's why the word that we find in the texts for person, a gang zak, it literally, etymo the etymology is gang is full, and then, so one is full of afflictions and then falls zak into samsara, gang zak. So uh, I don't know, honestly, if prior to the translation of Buddhist text, this, this word existed in Tibetan. It's not something that we usually use much in colloquial. In the monastery, sometimes we do because we're all trained in debate. And so we just say gang zak this or that, but it's not something that normal or ordinary people would say in speech. Um, so it may just be a technical term and a translation of a Sanskrit term, or it may be a case where there was already a pre-existing Tibetan term, and then the Tibetans added a creative etymology uh, to try to understand it. Um, it would translate, I believe, Pudgala from, from Sanskrit. Um, so it, it also is a bit of just a uh, one of these incongruencies in, in the texts sometimes that we just get used to. So a gangzak includes any being whatsoever. So a Buddha is also a gangzak. Now a Buddha does not is not full of afflictions and falling into samsara, but it doesn't, we say it, it's just the name, it's just the way that word etymologizes. It's not actually, you know, pervading that the person has that. But then we have the word semchen, right? A mind possessor, a sentient being. 
And a Buddha is not a sentient being, according to our text. However, the Buddha does have a mind. So the Buddha does fit the etymology there, but doesn't fit the actual pervasion of the word. Uh, this can be a little bit confusing. But once we get used to it, we see that a, a gangzak, a person, includes a Buddha. An assumption does not. A sentient being does not. So um, then we have, what does it mean to be contaminated? So in Tibetan, we have the word zakje. It means with contaminants, right? So we, we translated that in English as contaminated. is different than the contamination itself being the affliction. So this becomes a very broad and difficult topic. What does it mean to be contaminated? Because this term comes up again and again in the text. And of course, we have the the fundam the four karaki uh, chakyashi we say in Tibetan. It means the uh, how do you say the four seals that 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 determine that something is a Buddhist view, that somebody has the Buddhist philosophical view. So all compounded things are impermanent. All uh, contaminated things are suffering. All phenomena are empty and selfless, and nirvana is true peace. So the second one, all contaminated things are suffering. So that, that seems to be a very important central point for Buddhists, but what does it actually mean? What does contamination mean? And the four schools here have very different views on this. Uh, so we have the Vaibhashaka. This is based on the Abhidhamakosha uh, Vasubandhu. So it says, by way of observation or concomitance, it is suitable to endlessly proliferate contaminants. Now this is a, actually, although it's not what we ultimately accept if we want to follow the Prasangika school, it's very useful for our meditation. I remember one of the the gekus, the disciplinarians of of our monastery, Sarah, he he was uh, giving a talk one time, and he talked he talked about this. He was saying, I think he was talking about um, about phones, <laughs> mobile phones. He was saying you can really understand what it means to be contaminated. That something just endlessly proliferates uh, affliction because the more you use it, the more your afflictions increase. So the idea is that by way of observation, this is things like phones or any other external objects that generate attachment, that generate anger. The more we observe them, the more inflictions increase. Uh, so there's something like the body of the Buddha. Now in this system, of course, the body of the Buddha is afflicted, uh, sorry, is contaminated, but uh, and we'll see that's a distinction for the Satantrika, but other something else like the uh, the true path, right? That is uncontaminated. Now it is possible to generate contaminants, generate affliction toward the path. You can get, you can have desire in the sense of grasping at the path and, and or, or pride about thinking you have the path when you don't, things like that. But it doesn't endlessly proliferate it. It, it, it the object itself is not energized in such a way that it is going to lead to endless proliferation. Eventually, it will actually help you to get out of samsara if you focus on it long enough. Whereas other objects, the more we focus on them, it just never ends. There's not going to be some time that we suddenly fulfill our desire, and that's enough. Or concomitant. So the concomitance means because the um, the affliction is a mental factor, right? All afflictions are mental factors. So the main mind that is concomitant with that, or the other mental factors other than the afflictions that are concomitant with that, those are also contaminated. So the examples, for one thing, all forms. So in the Vaibhashika school, every single physical thing is contaminated, including the Buddha's body, uh, including uh, prayer flags and holy objects and whatever other things. Uh, all of it is just contaminated. So there's no way to be in samsara and be free of samsara at the same time. Uh, you have to just go into and remain list nirvana if you want to get out of this. So all forms, all people. All other all minds other than the direct perception of selflessness, right? So the only thing that is really uncontaminated, as it says, right, it's the very first or second verse of the, of the first chapter of Abhidhamakosha. It says, "London mind duche ni zakche." So all compounded things, all all uh, functioning things other than the truth of the path, are contaminated. And then the uncontaminated also includes uh, truth of cessation and uh, uncontaminated space. Those are those are not impermanent, so those are also uncontaminated. But other, among impermanent things, then we have just uh, just the truth of the path. So then the Sautantrika makes it a very slight distinction. 
Uh, and what we say by Satantrika, of course, we have to be clear where we're getting this source. It's not like every Satantrika is clear about what it means, but this is, has to do with Vasubandhu's uh, auto commentary on Abhidhamma Kosha, because uh, um, it's known that uh, Vasubandhu wrote Abhidhamma Kosha uh, originally as the Vaibhashika text. And then uh, when asked to compose a commentary, once he had already uh, left Kashmir, where he had been studying Vaibhashika, then he sent them in the mail this commentary that refuted their system. Uh, so he refuted his own text, but he didn't really believe it to begin with. He just was writing it uh, maybe to get a good grade or something. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, mainly, he, they thought he, his was the best text ever written in their school, even though he didn't actually believe what he was saying. So he he came and he came back and. Uh, negated a lot of the points that were written in that text. And one of them, in this context of uh, the what is contaminated, it, he didn't negate the fundamental idea of what it means to be contaminated, but he did argue that a Buddha's body is uncontaminated. That made, it was a distinction that he made. Um, and that the Buddha himself was uncontaminated. And the reasoning, so there was a debate among the Vaibhashikas themselves that if the Buddha's body is contaminated, then why is it an uninterrupted negative karma to wound the body of a Buddha? Because it's not really the Buddha anyway. The Buddha is just the mind of the Buddha. So then the uh, the counter argument that the Vaibhashikas gave anyway is that, well, it's like if you if you damage somebody's eye, the eye is not the eye consciousness, but the eye consciousness can't function without the eye. So you're obstructing the Buddha's activity by harming the body. Uh, but, but Vasubandhu had a counter argument, basically that there are problems with this because we say the reason this Vaibhajika said that the reason somebody is a Buddha is because of the truth of the path. That's what that's what makes them a Buddha. But he said then it's not doing anything. It's not making anybody a Buddha because the person isn't really a Buddha. Only the truth of the path is. So you're 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 negating yourself, your own your own ex, your own uh, uh, your own understanding of the of this truth of the path as making them a Buddha it doesn't it it it. It negates itself because then the Buddha isn't actually a Buddha. And secondly, more subtly, uh, Vasubandhu pointed out that uh, the Buddha and other Arya beings, because the Arya beings also are considered considered Sangha based on their perception of reality, their perception of selflessness. Uh, if you're saying because they, they they would argue that the only the truth of the path is really the Sangha, then because in this system. Uh, the true the these minds are not always manifest. Then, at the time, for example, when the Buddha is not manifestly meditating on selflessness, then there's no Buddha because there's no direct perception of selflessness. So then, there's it's not even suitable to call the person a Buddha anymore. So you have this uh, say this absurd consequence. So he says basically we have to say that the the body, Buddha's body, which is stable, is a Buddha, just like it is renowned in the world. He point and say that's the Buddha. So in that sense, the Buddha's body is a Buddha and is uh, uncontaminated, but the everything else, all the other forms are contaminated. So then we have the Chittimatra, it becomes a very different presentation. Uh, and it's fairly similar to what this Varandraka says, which is that it's related to any of the six doors of contamination. And this is quite important to understand, because if you're studying Prajnaparamita, this is what this is the main thing that when they talk about uh, contaminants. And when they say all contaminated things are uh, suffering, this is what they, they accept it in terms of these six doors of contamination. And I'll, look, I'll have a separate slide to explain what those are. So what are examples? It's anything arisen under the power of karma and afflictions. So as we'll see, that is uh, co-extensive with the truth of suffering. So anything that is a truth of suffering is necessarily contaminated and vice versa, uh, according to the to this system, the Chuttamatra. So it makes quite a lot of sense to say all contaminated things are suffering. And next we have the Zvatantrika. Uh, and again, oh, I should mention the Chuttamatra. Uh, this comes from the Abhidhamma Samuchaya by, by Asanga. He he discusses these six doors. So the Zvatantrika... Uh, they are. They do follow this text also, the Amidamra Samuchaya, but uh, they're also following Abhisamaya Lamkara. And as you might know, in the second chapter of Abhisamaya Lamkara, we have what's called the the the, the um, contaminated uh, truth of uh, sorry 
the path of meditation and the uncontaminated path of meditation. And what distinguishes those is the uh, presence of a, a conceptual appearance. So here, contaminant is no longer of an affliction, although that, that is one, the, the, the Savanandaka accept that is one kind of contaminant, but the second kind uh, is the meaning generality. The appearance of a meaning generality is also a kind of contaminant. It's a dualistic appearance. Uh, so that any, any conceptual mind is also contaminated. And then also afflictions in general. So the reason for this distinction is that afflictions are not necessarily related to one of the six doors. And the reason is that a, an Arya Bodhisattva's afflictions, the example being that it's like a poison that's been pacified by, by medicine or spells that no longer functions to poison the body, uh, then it's no longer uh, under the power of karma and afflictions, but it is still contam considered uh, contaminated. Now, that's a distinction that Jason Chuki Gelson makes in his uh, Tachu, the um, examining extremes. Uh, however, I haven't seen a specific uh, reference or basis for that in a Zavadhandaka text from India. It seems to be that Jade Sumba is, is inferring this based on uh, things that they might say. So here we say the same as before and conceptual thoughts. So it's a little bit more uh, precise uh, or broad than the Chittamatra view. So for example, for example, the Chittamatra system, uh, um, a lot of things that are not contaminated for Zavadhandraga are, are said so that are contaminated for Zavadhandraga won't be contaminated. Uh, conceptual realizations that aren't under the power of, con of power, karma and afflictions, like the conceptual truth of uh, path of meditation. And then finally, the Parasangika. So here it's polluted by ignorance or its imprints. So this is actually the most extensive of all. Almost everything is contaminated in this system. Um, because it's anything that is either itself uh, the belief in true existence has the appearance of true existence. So this is any mind other than the direct perception of emptiness. Uh, and then uh, furthermore, uh, the uh, any form that's arisen under that. Now that's a bit of a question of whether some people say that in this system that the forms are just irrelevant. They're not even questioned whether they're they are contaminated or not. Uh, but anyway, in his text, the Ocean of Reasoning, Sankapa does argue that they are uh, that because they arise under the power of the belief in true existence that that impels karma uh, at its root. Um, so all minds other than the direct uh, perception of emptiness. Well, I'm trying to move this here. Can't read the slide. Well, anyway, uh, so this is based on, uh, again, on Chandra Kirti. Now, this beca will become a debate when you get to Madhyamaka because uh, the commentator on Chandra Kirti, Jayananda, he, he believes that Chandra Kirti follows Vasubandhu because he usually does follow the Armada Makosha, but Sankapa argues that he misses something that Chandrakirti says in his commentary, Clear Words, uh, commentary on the root wisdom, where he talks about contamination in terms of being polluted by ignorance or its imprints. As a Mrikbatang, Mrikbe Raprit. So he says, uh, Mrikbe would be ignorance, then Raprit is like the cataracts of ignorance. So that's understood to be the imprints of ignorance. Okay, so next, yeah, Vasubandhu's distinction. I think actually I already discussed this. So the path of no more learning makes the Buddha a Buddha. So the Buddha is also uncontaminated. Uh, to wound a Buddha as an uninterrupted karma, that wouldn't make sense if the body is contaminated. And finally, if the Buddha, if the body was not a Buddha or not the Sangha in the case of the Arya beings, then when the uncontaminated path was not manifest, then the person would cease to be a Buddha or cease to be Sangha because there's no Buddha in their continuum anymore. So next we have the six doors of contamination. So this is six, any of, if something is any of these six, and it can be more than one of these six, then it is contaminated. This is first, we have the essence of contaminants, which is an affliction itself. And then we have related to contaminants, contam, contaminations, contaminants, it should say. So main minds and mental factors concomitant with affliction. So this is fairly similar to Vasubandhu's picture in the Abhidhamma Kosha. Then we have bound by contaminants. So this is karma performed under the power of afflictions. 
So the afflictions themselves motivate the karma, and the karma thereby is contaminated. And then resulting from contaminants, so this is ordinary beings with the seeds of affliction. And then simulacrum of contaminants, which is forms that generate contaminants. So this is external things that seeing them increases contamination. And then born from the cause of contaminants is contaminated aggregates. Uh, so this is just the ordinary, the five aggregates that we take on under the power of karma and afflictions. Uh, so in a lot of ways, it actually is coextensive with, with the Vaibhashika, except as we say in the in the Mahayana, there's the understanding that bodhisattvas and Buddhas can manifest these pure forms that are no longer contaminated. And they are more minds other than just uh, the uh, direct perception of emptiness. So uh, one uh, example that Jason Juki Gelson gives as something that's distinct uh, for both Svadhandrika and Chittamatra, that is uncontaminated, that would be contaminated for the Vibhashaka system, uh, is on the path of preparation when somebody has a um, clairvoyance that knows another's mind, because that's a direct perception. And so it's not contaminated by any of these means. Um, but at the same time, uh, uh, it for the Vibhashaka, it would certainly be contaminated. It's a, it's not a truth of the path. Okay, so next we have just a few minor points about contamination. So we have ordinary beings are always contaminated. So uh, Arya beings, not necessarily, but ordinary beings are always. So why? Because they have the seeds of affliction and will continuously cycle in samsara. So that's one reason. And I, I'm actually, I should say that these are various explanations that people come up with. So again, in his examining the extremes, uh, uh, Jason Shugi Gelson, he uh, um, he says that a being born, an ordinary being born in Sukhavati, right, the pure land of Amitabha, which is the only pure land where non-Arya beings are supposed to be born, uh, is still contaminated. Why? Because it's an ordinary being. But he doesn't say why. Uh, so different people come up with different explanations. So some say it's because they have the seeds of affliction and will continuously cycle. That we'll also talk about later in the very last slide. We probably won't be until next slide about whether that's possible to have the seeds of affliction while in Sukhavati or other pure lands. So then they, another explanation is because they they still generate, so to generate afflictions by observing themselves. So they are observed objects that increase afflictions. Right? They observe themselves and have attachment. Me, I, uh, they're very strongly, more so than an Arya being. So they become the object for their increase of their own afflictions. And then finally, this is my classmate suggested this, but I thought it was quite insightful, is that they are mainly engaging by conceptual thought. Because in the Svadhandraga system, ordinary beings, uh, sorry, con conceptual thought is a kind of contamination. And it's understood that ordinary beings mainly engage in the world by conceptual thought, whereas Arya beings, because of the direct perception of emptiness, they mainly, they mainly their main understanding comes from direct perception. So the or, in this sense, the being is contaminated. These are all just uh, conjectures and then things we can debate about. So then, uh, fully then another question is fully characterized contaminated. This is a term we see in, for example, the Golden Garland, so Gopas says that all fully characterized contamination, contaminated things are the truth of suffering. So then is he saying all contaminated things are under the truth of, of the truth of suffering? We'd say maybe not. It just means fully characterized contaminated means under the power of karma and afflictions, as opposed to the conceptual thought, which is a little different. This next point also is a major point of confusion. So it's good to clarify this. The meaning of contaminated in the context of the observed object of achievers is different. So when you study chapter one, you have the 10, 10 of the 70 topics and the, and the, what is it? The seventh, no, the, the fifth one, actually. Uh, fifth one is the uh, observed object of achievers. And then there's a list of different things that being the 11 topics that uh, bodhisattvas uh, observe. And one of them is contaminated. And the definition that Jetsun Juki Gelsen gives, which is based on, the, on, on Golden Garland by Sankapa, which is then based on the Indian commentaries, uh, is um, under the power of, for one thing, it's under the power of karma and afflictions, and it does not abide uh, in the class of being the antidote to the view of the self. Uh, so that seems to be 
it's not generally understood that he's saying, uh, for example, the conceptual realization of selflessness in this case is not contaminated because it's it is the the antidote to the view of the self. So some people, because that's clearly the concept, the conceptual understand the realization of selflessness in this Vadandaka system is contaminated. And some people argue, well, when he says abides in the class, that's that's you know that that's making this distinction, but. Really, the point here is that in this particular context, it's just what, what is taught in that part of the sutra. So there, there, when they talk about contaminated, they mean something totally different than what the Savarantika usually mean. So that's not really the definition of contaminated. It's only contaminated in that particular context. And so Kappa discusses these different contexts a little bit in uh, in the Golden Garland in that, in that section. And then finally, contaminated aggregates versus contaminated appropriating aggregates. That's just a little bit of a distinction. So contaminated aggregates, if a contaminated appropriating, appropriating aggregates is fairly co-determined, well, not a, with the coextensive with the truth of suffering in the in the continuum of sentient being, right? Whereas uh, contaminated aggregates it's pretty much anything that's an aggregate and is contaminated. So is for any of the reasons as above. Um, and aggregates can don't, don't have to be in the continuum of sentient beings. And also, for example, a bodhisattva's aggregates, which are not truth of suffering, or Arya bodhisattva's aggregates, they are still contaminated at aggregates. There is not contaminated at appropriating aggregates. This word nyerlin in Tibetan, right? It, it's a bit ambiguous. It's understood to be both appropriating and appropriated. So it's that which causes us to further cycle in samsara, and also that which we take on uh, from the from our past actions in samsara. Okay, so that's I think the end of this discussion of contaminated. Contaminated. It's a bit hard to say. I get tongue tied sometimes. It's a lot easier in Tibetan. Zakje. <laughs> so next we have afflicted truths and pure truths. So you'll see when you study the four noble truths, the definition of each of the truths, right? So in the definition of the, of the truth of suffering is a that which is an afflicted truth. Now, I, I don't know actually how you translate this in English. I, I looked in the FBMT dictionary and it wasn't in there. So I, in Tibetan, it's kunen yomon shoki dempa, right? So I think I, I truth of the fully afflicted class, right? So the truth, of, the truth of suffering is a truth of the fully afflicted class, which is characterized by impermanence, suffering, emptiness, and selflessness, right? And then the truth of uh, origin is similar. It's a fully afflicted class. And then the truths of cessation in the path is your pure truth, the truth of the pure class, right? But what does that mean? Uh, and especially because there are a number of terms that can easily get mixed up. So we'll see this if we read through uh, the Paracha Paramita literature carefully. We'll see three terms associated with the first side and then four with the second. So the first, I will go with the pure first because it's easier to go through one than one that has all four. So you have pure, which is namjong in Tibetan, which, mean, which literally means purified, that which has been purified. And then pure class, so namjong chok in Tibetan. And then pure truths, namjang dempa. And then truth of the pure class, namjang choki dempa. So those all mean slightly different things. So pure, first of all, means virtuous mental factors. You'll see this if you study the section on the path of preparation. And in, in Jitin Joki Gelson's explanation, he says that the uh, mental factor of faith, or said the, the, the power of faith, right? Not just the general mental factor, the power of faith which is a uh, kind of something that someone develops as they are approaching, entering the path. Uh, that is a virtuous mental factor. He says that's a namjang, right? It's a, it's it's pure, it's a virtuous, right? And then the pure class namjang chok is in the concomitant with that, so the the main mind, and so forth. So those are in that class, but they're not literally mental factors. And then pure truths. So pure truths is the truth of cessation and true paths. Now we know this, we can infer it by it in his uh, definition of the true, uh, the uh, art is a sangha, not the Buddha, 
Dharma jewel, right? Chukun chok, the Dharma jewel in the context of the three jewels of refuge, in his chidon, his general meaning, Jetsun Chuki Galson gives as a definition. So he says, a uh, pure truth in the continuum of an Arya being that uh, that uh, that uh, is characterized by the by the eight qualities such as being samjung uh, mepa. So it's uh, inexpressible or inconceivable. So the point is that, okay, here in one text, he's saying that it's any pure truth within the continuum of an Arya being. Then in the other text, his, his Tachu, the examining extremes, he, he actually changes the definition slightly. It says, uh, Pak Yugi uh, Goklam. So a true cessation or a true path in the continuum of an Arya being. So because he's saying the same thing, we can infer that by true pure truth, he means only these two things, true cessation and true path. Um, now, there is a very slight doubt as to whether uh, pure truths could include the truth, the path of accumulation and the pa path of preparation. Now, that wouldn't contradict his definition because he says Arya being, right? Uh, because in the, in the earlier in the first chapter, in the context of the three knowers, the Kinsum, then Jitsun Chuki Geltsun, there is a Kachik, right? A, a other view, and somebody talks about the pure, the, the, path of preparation is and the accumulation as being a pure truth. Now, Chaitan Kujigyatsan, he negates that person, but he doesn't negate that particular point. So it's questionable whether he actually accepts it or not. Why does he even write it in his text? He wrote, I mean, he made up the, what the person said, right? It wasn't that he was actually quoting someone as far as I know. Um, nevertheless, uh, it's not clear. It does, it's unlikely. It seems kind of odd that it would be. Um, because it's it, pure truth should mean it's it's one of the truths, one of the four truths. So then, uh, truth of the pure class. So this is Namjong Chuki Damba, right? So this this includes just one more thing. You have true cessations, which are the purified true paths of the purifiers, and emptiness, which is the object of purification. Now we know that because in the context of the path of preparation, we have the uh, the not how do you say? The 36 um, conceptual abandonments, right? Uh, again, uh, in, in English, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little uh, stumble on the words a bit, but we have, uh, right, so you have in the the, uh, um, the six the six main things that distinguish the uh, Mahayana path of preparation from the Hinayana path. And one of them is that they take these uh, these conceptual uh, thoughts or con you know, conceptual dopa, right, we say in Tibetan, as uh, objects of of abandonment, and uh, then there's this list of what those are, right? So in Drawa Donso, the uh, Hari Bhadra's commentary, he lists 36, and there are nine of each of the classes. So uh, in the terms of the truth of the pure class, those things that are related to both uh, substantial and uh, imputed. So don't worry too much if this is all a little, little bit confusing. But the main point is he gives nine examples of things that are truth of the pure class. And one of the examples he very clearly gives is emptiness. So it's clear that he's saying emptiness is a truth of the pure class, that if you observe emptiness and believe it to be truly existent, that is the kind, that is one of the conceptions that's talked about here, that observes the truth of the pure class. And then Sankapa says in his commentary in the Golden Garland, it's emptiness is the truth of the pure class because it's the object by which you meditate on to become purified. However, then there's the question, why is selflessness of person not so it should be the same uh because the direct realization of the self of person is certainly just as much a true path uh but it's not totally clear maybe it is um i think as i recall and i'm not i'm blinking maybe a bit now but i think in debate we kind of established it probably is not that the truth of the selflessness of person is not a truth of the pure class but uh there's some there's a question about that. So then we have the afflicted side, right? So fully afflicted is afflictions. Then fully afflicted class is concomitant with afflictions. So it's sort of similar to the opposite. And then truth of the fully afflicted class, this just means arisen under the power of karma and affliction. This is synonymous with the truth of suffering. Now there's no mention anywhere of true, of afflicted truth, right? So without the chok. So we have in on this one side, we have the pure truths and truth of the pure class, but we never see the term 
truth of the afflicted class and then afflicted truth. There's not, it's just not a term that comes up. So I don't have to uh, describe, give a meaning for it. So then we have ripened effects, right? Namin gidrebu in Tibetan, right? So what is a ripened effect? So we, we can mainly base this on uh, this verse from the Arbidharma Kosha by Vasubandhu. So uh, I apologize. I, I tend to translate things, especially because I'm trying to copy the meter of the Tibetan with a bit of uh, arcane language, but this is exactly how it reads in Tibetan. So I don't explain what it means. So ripens are unspecified, expressed in sentient beings and come as subsequence to specifieds. So ripens means ripened results and unspecified means they are neither virtuous nor non-virtuous. Expressed in sentient beings means that they are included in the continuum of a sentient being and come as subsequence to specified. So specified means virtue or non-virtue. They come as the result of virtue or non-virtue. So this generally people say, then then you can say anything that fulfills these three, these three qualifications uh, is, a, uh, is a ripened result. However, there's a bit of a qualification we'll have to make, and this is actually made by the first Dalai Lama, Gyal Gendendrup, in his commentary. So ripened effects are, one, unobscured. They are not associated with afflictions because they cannot they can exist after afflictions have been abandoned. Right? So an Arya being, I say an Arhat still has ripened effects. Their body is still a ripened effect. Uh, so they are unobscured, meaning that they are not, uh, they're necessarily not virtuous. Uh, or non-virtuous. They're necessarily unspecified and uh, neutral. Uh, sorry. No, I have... Uh, yeah, they're not associated with afflictions, right? Not uh, un unobscured, not unspecified. So they're not, not associated with afflictions, right? Anything that's an affliction is is generating further result. It's not itself the result, right? So then unspecified, uh, so they are not virtuous or non-virtuous. They're neither virtuous nor non-virtuous because they can exist in the absence of either of those two, right? So you just experience the result of past actions. You're not creating a new action. So even if you you no longer have virtue and non-virtue, uh, you know, for example, uh, if you're uh, if you're the examples they give, when you're in the uh, form and formless absorptions, you no longer have non-virtue, but you're still ex experiencing the results of past effects. And then it, the example they give the opposite is when you have cut your roots of virtue. This is another very big question of what that really means, and I won't talk about it here. But basically, when nobody is no longer creating virtue, uh, they still have non-virtue, but they still have the ripened results. So it doesn't require virtue. It does not require non-virtue. And then three, they are included in the continuum of sentient beings. They are experienced in an uncommon way, meaning they are a private experience. Right. So the truth of suffering includes the external world. But uh, uh, ripened results do not. It only is included in the sentient beings. Otherwise, karmic effects would be mixed, right? So my ripened result would be ex experienced by somebody else. As uh, Chandakirti has the famous line, Shangi, uh, what is it? Sengi Sapa, Shangi Sa, right? So whatever somebody, one person uh, accumulates, one person, other person experiences. He gives that as a consequence, right? And then for... They are subsequent to either virtue or non-virtue, but not immediately, only after, after after a gap of time. So that's the distinction, right? So they are they arise sub there has to be the result of virtue or non-virtue. But if we didn't give this qualification, then the problem is that the imprint, the immediate imprint of the of the action would be a ripened effect because it would fulfill the first three qualifications. It would be unobscured, it would be unspecified and would be included in the continuum of a sentient being. But it's not a ripened effect. It shouldn't be understood as that. The ripened effect is, something, is like the result of the action that comes when that, that imprint ripens, right? That's the whole point of ripen. So it's unripened at that point. So it says oh, not immediately, only after a gap of time. So it's once that thing, uh, that, that imprint ripens. Now we could say, well, you have the, the second moment of the imprint. Maybe that fits here. So then you have to make a more of a distinction, but I'll leave that to... You, if you want to debate about that. So then there are also uncontaminated ripened effects, as we talk about, although honestly, I haven't seen a very clear presentation of it. Maybe when we study Arbhidharma next year, we'll we'll get to it. Uh, but in, in Pradnya Paramita, it just mentioned, for example, the Sambhogakaya, uh, body of the Buddha, uh, that is a ripened, a pure ripened effect. And then the, uh, the un what do you say? 
Barchin Melam is uh, unobs unobstructed path, right? The direct perception of emptiness that uh, it is that is uh, a uncontaminated ripened cause. Um, so how exactly that works, uh, I will just leave that for now. But just to that you uh, you know that there, if you might see these terms and wonder what they're talking about, so they do not necessarily fit these parameters above here. So really, a ripened effect; they, those are ripened effects. So when we talk about ripened effects, we're talking about contaminated ripened effects, right? So now we have background information for samsara. What is meant by samsara? How do we define, in terms of if we're going to debate it, what do we define what is and is not samsara? So here's a proposed definition of samsara that, that Jason Shirky Gelson rejects. Continuous cycling over a long period of time under the power of karma and afflictions, which would be kind of a basic definition you might think to say, what does it mean? What does samsara mean? But the counter example he gives is the fault there. And then, then an ordinary being would be samsara, right? I would be samsara because I am continuously cycling over a long period of time under the power of karma and afflictions. Uh, now, uh, you, uh, you might see in English, I said continuously as opposed to continuous, but in Tibetan, it's the same, right? Tibetan is a little more fluid. So it sounds like you're saying the same thing. But the problem here is that the cycler cannot be the cycle, right? This, the samsara means circling, right? So the person who's circling can't be the one, can't be the circling itself. The doer cannot be the action. And this is based, uh, for example, we have this quotation from Root Wisdom by Nagarjuna in chapter 10. If fuel is fire, it ensues. The doer is the action too, right? So the the the, the one that in Tibetan we say, chipo tang le, right? The the actor. So when you have any compound sentence, um, I am lighting a fire, right? I'm the one doing something, and the fire is the action to which I on which I am acting. Uh, it, they they can't be the same thing, otherwise the there's they can't be a transitive sentence. Uh, now, of course, well, I could say, well, I am motivating myself. That's a, maybe a little bit different. Um, but uh, in terms of what I'm acting upon, at least in terms of how the sentence functions, it is treating it as two different objects, even though they ultimately come down to the same thing. Uh, but anyway, the understanding here is that there has to be a person cycling, and then there's the cycle in which they're cycling. Another way to understand it is that it wouldn't be possible to get out of samsara if you were samsara. You can't abandon yourself. Right, you have to abandon some sorrow. Uh, of course, what are you really abandoning? That that is a more difficult question because everything that you know as yourself is some sorrow. Your aggregates are all some sorrow. So who's getting out if there's nothing else other than the aggregates? Right? There's no there's no self apart from the aggregates. So a more precise definition. This is not something that we see in any text, um, but it's what everyone says or a lot of people say in debate. Now I asked one of my classmates, where is it? He said, oh, it's in the Lamrim, but that's not true. <laughs> it's not the kind of thing some couple would say in the Lamrim. It sounds like something that we say a Durapugo, a little kid in debate would say. So any true suffering in the continuum of a cycler other than the cycler himself. But that's very specific. And it's, it's we say pervasive. So any true suffering that's within the continuum of a person of a, who's in samsara, a cycler. It's not just any person, right? An arhat can have true suffering. That's no longer samsara because they've abandoned samsara. Uh, but other than the cycler himself or herself, so that person is not uh, is not samsara. So an arhat no longer cycles and so has abandoned samsara. He or she still has true suffering, but that suffering is not samsara, or true suffering is not samsara. And then another point is that any of the 12 links of the dependent origination is necessarily samsara. Uh, so one cycles through the 12 links, not through a place. That's what cycling really means. Cycling through the 12 links of dependent origination. It doesn't mean cycling through the six realms. It is a misunderstanding because the external world is not samsara. It's only the continuum of a sentient being. Um, now, colloquially, we might say we cycle through the six realms. Uh, we say, uh, I've been cycling in samsara since beginningless time in the various states of existence, but that's a bit more of a, you know, not, a, not it's sort of how we, we might think of it to get a feeling of it. But if we really want to be precise and understand what samsara really is, we have to be clear that the, that the external world is not the point. The point is your own experience of it. Um, now, to make it so, another distinction, so 
any of the 12 links is necessarily samsara, but not the other way around. Something that's samsara is not necessarily one of the 12 links. Now, why? If one easy example is the main mind that's concomitant with the seventh link of, of feeling, right? Feeling is a mental factor. So when you have the seventh link of feeling, it's not the other links because they have reached the seventh link, but then the main mind is not feeling. But nevertheless, it's it's still samsara. So it's not 100%. But for the most part, we'd say samsara is the one of the 12 links. Okay, so then number five, nature of suffering. So I made that distinction just a moment ago. Now I will explain what that means. So in in Tibetan, it, it's a different, but it's hard in English because it's it's a bit wordy to say nature of suffering, but we have to be very careful, right? So for example, if we say truth of suffering is characterized by the four things, impermanence, suffering, emptiness, selflessness, it really should be nature of suffering, right? This, because it means slightly different things. So suffering, dungyel in Tibetan, is not synonymous with in the nature of suffering, dungyelwa, right? So there's wa in Tibetan. So I think the best way we could translate it into English would be sufferingness, because the wa functions very much like a, a nominalizer. Um, and suffering is already a noun, but uh, like the, the state of something. Uh, so the state of suffering. So something that is both, we'll give first examples of things that are one or the other, and then we can talk about what they actually mean. So an ordinary being's experience of pain, that is pain, so it's suffering, the feeling of pain. And then the it is in the nature of suffering because it's under the power of karma and afflictions. It's the truth of suffering. And there's something that is suffering, but is not in the nature of suffering, and already is true path that is regret for past negative actions. This is there's pretty not many examples of this, but the here is one. So it's it's suffering, right? An Arya being thinks about past negative actions and feels regret for that, and it's a suffering sensation. But it's a true path, so it's necessarily not the nature of suffering. True path has to be contrary to the truth truth of suffering. And then something that is the nature in the nature of suffering, but is not suffering in an ordinary experience, being experience of pleasure. And so ordinary beings. Uh, experience pleasure, and that is suffering of change. So it's in the nature of suffering. It's the truth of suffering. Maybe we can make one distinction is that it, if you have an ordinary being in Sugavati again, like before, that is one of our uh, game breakers. You know, we have these different, how do you say, chichen in Tibetan. So subjects you, you can bring in and that makes it nothing pervades. But for the most part, right, ordinary people who are not in pure lands, in the pure land, then maybe it's not the the feeling is not in the nature of suffering. Uh, and then something that is neither is a direct perception of selflessness, right? This is a truth of the path. It's it's not a suffering sensation either. So then we have a couple other questions. Uh, so let me just mention. So to make it clear, right? Suffering, dungel, that is a feeling. It is a uh, it is a mental factor. So it can be either physical or mental, but it's not a main mind, and it's not a it's not it's not any other uh, it could aggregate. So, you know, it's not the the body. Uh, it's not an external world. Whereas dungyawa and the nature of suffering, it means under the power of karma and affliction. So it's synonymous with the truth of suffering. Uh, so when we say all suffering thing, all contaminated things are suffering. We're talking about in the nature of suffering. We're not saying all contaminated things are are the feeling of suffering. That would be quite an absurd consequence. So then we say, uh, can external objects be the nature of the suffering of suffering or the suffering of change? So in the Lamrim Chemo, Sankapa says they are. If you read closely, Lamrim Chemo, he says, suffering of suffering is not only the feeling, it's also the external things that generate that feeling. And the suffering of change is not only the feeling of pleasure, it's also the external things that generate that. Uh, now, among the different uh, Gelu scholars, there's different opinions on this. And uh, Jamia, Kunkin Jamia Shepa, who is the author for the Gomong, right, he he does follow this very precisely. And he says that the external... So the truth of suffering, also, like suffering of suffering, is not just the feeling of suffering. It's also things that generate suffering. And it's how we use it colloquially. We say this is, a very, this is just a very suffering experience we're having. I mean, I don't know. It sounds a bit funny, but... You know, we 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 went through so much suffering. It's not we're not just talking about my feeling. We're talking about all the different tribulations in my life, and then the suffering of change. It's also the things that generate that. 
But in this, at least in Sarah J, with Sri Chankajiki Gelson, he does not agree with that. And he says, you know, that's not to be taken literally what Sankhapa is saying, that really it's 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 all, the suffering of suffering is only the, the cessation, sensation of suffering. So I have suffering of change is only the sensation of pleasure. And then the other external things is sort of in a loose way can be said to be that, but it's not technically so. And then what about the suffering of aging, right? So we have the four main sufferings of a sentient, of, an, of a human being anyway, is birth, old age, sickness, and death, right? So, or old age, actually, it is aging in Tibetan, right? Gawa. Um, so it, it, we use that word, so is it suffering? Uh, that's, a, that's also a bit of a question. So that would be another counterexample if we say that suffering is only the feeling. Well, then, then birth and old age and sickness or death are not really suffering after all. Uh, and then in the nature of suffering, so this is just to make it clear, our terms, right? So these are four synonyms. So in the nature of suffering, pervasive compositional suffering, true suffering, arisen under the power of karma and affliction. So those are all coextensive, at least in Jitsun Juki Gelson's system. Uh, now in Sarah May, Kajip Tempa Tempa Darge is the author. Uh, they do he does disagree. The nature of suffering is, is or at least per, per, pervasive compositional suffering in his system is very specific, and it does not pervade the other two. But in Jason Jiggy Geltzen's system, all truth of suffering is pervasive compositional suffering. Okay, so now we've had the background information. So now we get to this first major topic. I think what have we done? A little over an hour now. I guess we say from when we started the talk, it's been an hour. So now we get to the first major subject. And this is this is the hardest debate. It, this you can never end this debate in uh in the Four Noble Truths. And people have all kinds of different opinions. And even if you have a good opinion and you understand the background, if somebody knows how to debate well, you'll have a hard time because it's just not easy to, to make a clear statement about this. And now the, the very simple point, of course, is fairly straightforward, but when we get into these details, it's, it gets difficult. So first we have this quotation from the Sublime Continuum, right? First, know the ailment, then forsake its cause. Attain well-being relying on the cure. With suffering, the cause, its end, the path, know, forsake, attain, rely on it. So this is comparing the, the order of the truths to the or the order of diagnosing an illness, right? Know the ailment, know what, you first to know that you're sick, then recognize what the cause is and abandon that cause, and then attain well-being, relying on the cure to the, to the illness or the medicine. So likewise with suffering, and then the cause, the origin, and then its end, which is, uh, which is cessation, and the path. Uh, know suffering, Forsake the cause, attain uh, a cessation, and rely on the path. Right? This is how the Buddha exhorted the monks in the very first uh, uh, sutra, right? In the Dharma turning wheel, wheel, <laughs> wheel of Dharma turning sutra, right? Dharma chakra. Uh, so he said, uh, "No, no suffering. Abandon the cause. Attain cessation. Rely on the path." So it's understood to be in terms of the order in which one uh, recognizes the illness and then comes to want to be free of it. So in terms of cause and effect, the order should be origin, suffering, because the origin is the cause of the suffering. We say this is the, in terms of the terms we used before, we used before the truth of the fully afflicted class, or then the origin side, the cause side of that is the origin, the result side of that is suffering. And then in terms of the truth of the, the pure class, then the cause side is the path, and the result is suffering. Now, it's not a real result because it's not a functioning thing. It's a result uh, in terms of you might know the five kinds of results. We say the result, which is a which is a uh, separation, right? But it's in the sense that it, you attain it through meditating on the path, right? So then the but then the order of teaching is in terms of the order of realization as opposed to the order of arising. So many Indian texts, such as the Trilogy of Abhidharma, Commentary and Valid Cognition, and others, they state that this order, they said they use the words in the terms of its order of realization. And many Tibetan commentaries are even more explicit. So there's a text, I don't think it's in English, it's Arranged Path of Valid Cognition. It's a very nice short text by Tsongkhapa talking about uh, Dharmakirti's system and how it can be used for personal practice. 
So he says, Sankapa explicitly calls this the order in which they are realized by valid cognition. That's a very explicit statement. So it's not uh, it's not easy to to just say how he's just using that loosely, right? Uh, and actually, I say realized. I think it's semengepa, right? It was ascertained, which is actually in some sense more precise. Ascertained by valid cognition. So, okay, but then accepting these statements literally is problematic for a number of reasons. So we'll see what, what those are. So first of all, realizing true suffering first, right? That should be first if you realize them in that order. Do you realize the definition of true suffering? What is the definition? It's that which is uh, a truth of the purely, truly, uh, the truth of the uh, fully afflicted class, right? Which is, which is, uh, characterized by being impermanent in the nature of suffering, empty and uh, and selfless, right? So that case, do you realize this second point in the nature of suffering? What does that mean? So in that case, do you realize under risen under the power of karma and afflictions? Because that's what the word means. In the nature of suffering, that's something that is going to be, uh, you know, it's just a, it's just a, let's say the the definiendum of the definition under the power of karma and afflictions. So in that case, do you realize the origin, right? To realize suffering, you have to realize that something is under the power of karma and affliction. It's not just to, enough to know I stubbed my toe. That's not recognizing the truth of suffering. You have to know actually what it means to be the truth of suffering. So you've already recognized that it comes from karma and afflictions. So that's the first thing that becomes a doubt. I remember that <laughs> very many years ago now. Was it 12 years ago when we first debated this? Uh coming to debate one morning and my classmate uh, just asked me that question and I was taken aback. I thought, oh, I don't have an answer. So then you start having doubt and start thinking maybe it's not so straightforward after all. So then we have two ancillary points just and now we talk about this. this. So we'll, we'll get back to what is the, uh, how do we answer this debate or what are the other doubts that come up? But then we have this question, okay, karma and affliction, do you realize truth of suffering, you realize that it's un something is under the power of karma and afflictions. Well, some people say, well, look, karma and affliction, at least the workings of karma is said to be very subtle phenomena, very hidden phenomena, right? Phenomenon. So in that case, is karma a very hidden phenomenon? In that case, arisen under the power of karma and afflictions is a very hidden phenomenon, is it? So in that case, are the Four Noble Truths a very hidden phenomenon? Some people say yes. Some people say, well, yes, for this reason. I mean, some, I say some people, some people who are new to debate <laughs> is not something I, I don't think any any uh, traditional scholar would say for the reasons I'll show that are very problematic. However, it would seem if we say that that, that karma is a very hidden phenomenon, it should be. Uh, the truth of suffering should be. But then we have this major problem that comes from that very fundamental problem. So I don't know if any of you, you studied um, uh, Takrik, right? Um, what is it? Uh, signs and reasons, right? Uh, maybe you've studied a little bit and, and how you frame a consequence and you have or a, 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 a correct sign and you have the correct sign from the point of view of uh, each air, right? Of, of belief. So that you can infer that a, a scriptural quotation is valid based on understanding the the minor points of what the Buddha says, right? So it's very clear in Dharma Kirti, uh, his in uh, commentary on valid cognition is so So you're you're incontrovertible. Or the Buddha was incontrovertible in regards to the main point. So we can infer that his teachings on the other minor points, which are hidden to us. We can infer that they're that they are valid, that we we can trust in them. So maybe trust is a better word, a valid a valid sign based on trust in the in the in the person's judgment of what they're saying. So the the classic example of this is this one I give right here. Take the subject, the quotation from giving wealth from ethics happiness, right? So this is saying if you practice generosity, you'll have wealth in the future life, resources. And if you practice ethical discipline, you'll have happiness, which means a po positive rebirth in the future life. So then the it is says it is incontrovertible to its intended meaning because it is a quotation pure by the three analyses, right? So it is uh, not harmed by uh, direct perception or by inference or by examining uh, the internal text, right? The person speaking, it doesn't contradict themselves. They don't say one thing one place and something else another place. 
Now that whole that particular con thing that I just said, this 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 uh say uh the inference from trust or from belief, this itself is a major point of debate. Uh I think if we later have talks on on uh valid cognition in a couple of years, we should make a separate talk for this. Uh this is extremely difficult. <laughs> but nevertheless, the main point here, just which is doesn't require understanding all of the details, is the example here, right? For example, the teaching on the Four Noble Truths, right? So the Buddha, oh, sorry, when, Dhar when Dharmakirti says, so don't let me here, the Buddha was incontrovertible as to the main point, he's talking about the Four Noble Truths. So the Buddha, we can infer because we can understand that the Buddha's teaching on the Four Noble Truths was valid, that the things he taught on more hidden things are also valid. So if the Four Noble Truths itself was a very hidden phenomena, we couldn't do that because there would be no basis for inferring anything the Buddha said was correct because even his most fundamental teaching is very hidden. So if the, it says, if the Four Noble Truths were very hidden phenomena, this would not be a valid example. So this is absolutely not possible. You cannot say the Four Noble Truths are very hidden. And that would also undermine our whole uh, our whole mission as Buddhists, which is to try to use reasoning into the path. If it, the whole thing was based on belief, the four, we have to just believe the Buddha when he says that the truth of suffering uh, arises from karma and afflictions. It's not It's not something we can actually infer by any reasoning. So that's very problematic. Um, so uh, it looks like I didn't actually make any, any bullet points here about what would be an answer to that. But basically, the point that we usually say is that for a couple of things, one is Karma and afflictions in general is not a very hidden phenomenon. That's important. Uh, knowing that a positive action can create a positive result and a negative action, or more specifically, a positive effect came from a positive result. <laughs> a positive effect came from a positive cause. That is not very hidden. That was something we can use inference to understand. But understanding a very specific thing. So the reason I didn't say I I won't say a positive cause causes a positive result is because that's the problem. So Kappa gives that very example in this text I just mentioned, the arranging the path of valid cognition. He says, for example, you can tell by looking at somebody in the afternoon that they were doing prostrations in the morning because you could tell by their physical state what kind of whether they were exercising in the morning. Right? You can't tell from doing prostrations in the morning. How are you going to feel in the afternoon? Right? You, you could die in the at midday. There's just no way to predict the future from knowing particular points of the of current events. But you can look at the past. So likewise, you can know from your current state the kind of things you probably did in a past life. You can't know exactly what you did and where and when it happened, but you can infer that certain actions were probably done. Now. Okay, that's one thing, but then, of course, the deeper question is how can you even infer in the first place that certain results are going to come from certain certain causes? This is a big point that will come up in the second chapter of, of Dharmakirti's text. The main point seems to be that we can first of all infer within one life. We can, in, we can start to understand by looking at people's behavior over a long period of time that people who are very selfish and... Uh, act in ways that harm others, ultimately suffer as a result, mentally. Uh, and also, oftentimes, not just mentally, but they get put in jail or have other major problems in their life. Not always, but it's uh, fairly unusual. Although, of course, there are major counterexamples, but it's fairly unusual that people just go around getting angry at everybody all the time, and they always have wonderful things happen to them. Um, so, we can see, at least in a general sense, that uh, people create their own circumstances through their behavior and through their thoughts. And through their thoughts, especially, they create the way they experience things. The more negative thoughts they have, the more negatively they experience things. So then we can in, we start to, if we can infer that there are past lives, and that's a major point of the second chapter, is trying to infer that there are past lives. Then we can start to infer that that process continues over many lifetimes. It's not just some, it's no reason that if it's continuing in this life, it's not going to also have an effect in other lives. That's the very basic point. Um, but of course, there are many questions that are left. Nevertheless, the idea is that it's not a very hidden phenomenon. 
if what is very hidden is knowing specifics of it and knowing uh, what a particular action now will have in the future. In any case, right? We can't even if we do a good action, we can't say for sure it's going to have a good result. Uh, it's not going to bring a bad result in and of itself, but we don't know whether that the merit is going to be destroyed, for example, by anger or something else. Or if we do a very negative action, the person could purify it before they experience the negative result. So then the second question here is, why is suffering to be known? Aren't all the four truths to be known? And so there's a few different ways of answering that. Um, so one of the, the more philosophical answer is that uh, generally, yes, but for the latter four truths, known means knowing the characteristics specific to them. Right, so you know the origin, meaning that you know the 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 four characteristics, which are cause, origin, strong production, and uh, condition. Right, the, you'll see that when you study them. But knowing suffering also entails something different, which is the general characteristic of selflessness, which pervades everything. So when we say know the four noble truths in the sixteen aspects, mainly it's about knowing selflessness, which is one of the four aspects of the of suffering. So that is the main object to be known by one who is seeking liberation, and it is the first thing to know. Uh, so therefore, the truth of suffering is the first thing to know. So therefore, it's called to be known. Uh, so that that's the that 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 sorry that that second sentence, the last sentence there. That's the more kind of colloquial answer, not philosophical. Is simply that first we know suffering, and then on that basis, then we search for the cause. Right. So that's another way of looking at it. So then here's another just simple, similar point. So we say abandon the cause. Now, suffering is also to be abandoned, but why do we say abandon the cause? It's because only by abandoning the cause can we abandon the, or, the, the suffering itself. And then also it says attain sensation, cessation. But we also attain the path, but it says the path is also to be attained. But in the end, is it, it is abandoned like a raft, right? This is something that we see in a lot of the traditional texts, especially as in Mahayana Sutra Lamkara, that specifically has that line. But I think it comes, it's also the sutra, the Buddha said that. So it, the path itself is understood as only a means towards the end of attaining the, the, um, the truth of cessation, which is the real goal. Now in the Mahayana, there's a little bit of distinction about that. But anyway, that's at least the, there's this truth the teaching on the Four Noble Truths was originally a Hinayana teaching. So just last last night, no, two nights ago, was it two nights ago? Uh, we had a debate at our at our house group, right? The Kangzin. So these these two new Rikchung, they came. Uh, they have to answer debate for us. And so, uh, yeah, we asked uh, we asked him why because it says in the in the text, right, that the 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 um, sutra that's spoken by ordinary sentient beings, uh, it is uh, it is not the final refuge because it is like a raft has to be abandoned when they attain Buddhahood. So we asked him, that's that's a nice, nice thing to say, but it's very hard to say, what does that mean? And we asked him and he said, well, because the continuum of it does continue to continue to a Buddha, but nevertheless, uh, the, the, the aspect of it, which is contaminated for an ordinary being, that's no longer contaminated. And so then, of course, we pointed out the major flaw in what he just said, which is that speech is sound. So does the sound just continue until the person's a Buddha? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, so then he he had quite a bit of a hard time correcting himself there. That's that's just uh, some of the the fun points of debate. But what does it really mean? Abandon something like a raft, right? What how, what do we do? It's, it is even still there to abandon. Okay, so back to the main point. So okay, so we have this issue, that very clear issue. First of all, if you realize suffering then you've already realized the origin, it would seem. So is it really about recognizing it in terms of uh, valid cognition? So some people say, it's when it says order in terms of realization, it really means, it means order of examination, which means order of practice. Right. First, you spend some time thinking about the, the truth of suffering. It doesn't mean you have a like valid, full valid cognition of it where you have a realization of the truth of suffering. It just means that you you contemplate on at first as a, as your order of contemplation. So that's a very uh, easy answer in the sense that you can't really debate that so well. When somebody says that, it's it's you know it's okay. that's just how people that's what they mean. Now well, some of the problems are, for example, as I said earlier, in texts like Sonkapa, he, his text he's very clear. It says 
ascertainment by valid cognition. So it's, it doesn't seem to be what they're saying. However, we look at this presentation, for example, by Jason Chucky Gelson. It's kind of what he's talking about. So here he says, here there is a reason for teaching the order in accordance with the order in which they are realized by an object possessor. Initially, having examined carefully the general and specific faults of samsara, one generates the wish to be free of suffering. And so it's just talking about your own contemplation and you wish to be free of suffering. Next one analyzes, uh, am I capable or not of separating from suffering? Does suffering have a cause or not? As for that cause, is it permanent or impermanent? Thereby analyze the origin, right? And then analyzing in that way, one comprehends that the karma and afflictions within the 12 links of dependent relativity. So the, the karma and afflictions, that's going to be the second and the 10th, the second, second and the ninth. No, it's second and 10th link. That's right. No, 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 sorry. Karma is the second link. Afflictions is going to be the ninth and 10th, right? Craving and, and grasping, right? That's what they're talking about. So within the 12 links of dependent origination, uh, so did I say ninth and 10th? Eighth and ninth is what I meant. Uh, or cause of suffering. So one generates the wish, the mind wishing to abandon those. So thereby suffering is taught first and the origin is second. So there he's saying it's you, what you what you examine in that order. And seeing that one can abandon the origin, one comes to see that it is possible to actualize cessation. Actualizing that, moreover, hinges upon having the path in one's continuum and meditating on it, on it. Thereby therefore cessation is taught third in the path, fourth. So these these are very useful words to contemplate and think about. And what is he saying? Is he saying just in terms of you think about it in this order, as opposed to just that you that you uh, generate the specific realization. However, again, when we debate, we learn to be very, very precise. So these things that it seems like, well, we ask, what does he mean when he says general and specific faults, right? What does it mean to generate the wish? What is that wish? Is it a path? Is it a valid cognizer? He says, am I capable or not of separating from suffering, right? What does that mean? A cause or not? Is it permanent or impermanent? We have to be, every single word has to be looked at very carefully, but that's all honest. That's um, you know, ideally what you would do if you were actually doing what, he's, what he is uh, instructing, right? You would think about exact, very precisely, what does this all mean? So, okay. So then another answer that people might mean is that maybe one doesn't realize the origin in its entirety. I think this is actually a more precise answer. So when we say, Realizing under the power, risen under the power of karma and afflictions means realizing these as the basis of faults. One realizes some piece of karma and afflictions, but not the entire process. So we see that to some extent, we can start to see that things, that suffering experiences come from past karma and afflictions. It does not necessarily mean that we understand the full process of how the 12 links function, which is what we need to do to really understand uh the second, uh, the second truth. So uh, to, to back this point up, here's this quotation from Dharmakirti, where he says that, so there's one thing missing here, right? Karma and afflictions, but also ignorance, right? We have the 12 links. We said the second and then the, se the eighth and the ninth, but the first link, ignorance, is also the truth of origin. So you might realize in a general sense, and even, even non-Buddhists are said to be able to see that, that in a general sense, they can see how karma and afflictions leads to uh, exp suffering experiences. But uh, they don't realize that the root of that is affliction, is, is ignorance. So Dharmakirti says this, that so non-knowing here, this is talking about ignorance. It's just He used the word mashe as opposed to marik. It says, non-knowing is samsara's cause, but wasn't taught, just craving was. So in the sutra, when the Buddha said originally, that craving is the origin of suffering, right? And in, in Theravada, they emphasize that very strongly, more so than in the Tibetan tradition where they're, they tend to emphasize more on this, this not the ignorance as the, as the root and trying to generate the right view. So then he says, why was craving taught first? It says, it propels the stream and it is, is the immediate one. Karma is not because with it, there is, there is not. So I'll say what that means. That's exactly how he says it, but it's a little confusing. So craving was taught because it propels the stream, right? The real thing that's thrusting you into samsara and pushing you forward, that is craving, right? Although behind that is ignorance, it's craving that's pulling you on. 
and it is the immediate one, right? The immediate thing that that bring that ripens suffering is craving. Uh, so uh, the ignorance is more distant; is an earlier cause, and karma is not. Uh, so karma also among karma and afflictions, afflictions are more strongly the cause. Because and then the reason is because with it there is there's not is meaning with craving there is still samsara, with just karma there is not, with an arhat still has karma they do no longer they no longer have craving they no longer have samsara, so you just realize so the point here is that you might realize some piece of karma and afflictions but you don't understand the underlying process of ignorance so you just see a little piece of things. So then we have a debate from the clarifying the path to liberation. Now it's uh, we want to have half an hour for questions and answer, but I think we'll finish uh, because we started a little late. So we'll and we have so we'll finish this section here. It'll be that's I think the best way to do, it, and then we'll have the next topic next time. So a debate a debate from clarifying the path to liberation. This is Galtzev Jay's commentary on uh, on Dharma Kirti on the valid commentary and valid cognition. So somebody debates. Uh, this is a similar point to this earlier thing about, you know, that you see suffering and therefore you see the origin. So they're giving a more broad debate here. So by first seeing suffering, by first seeing you can end suffering, you understand that you can end suffering, There, you must thereby see you can actualize cessation. right? So you, if you understand the origin, you should understand cessation already because you see that you can end suffering. But you can see that the or it says, no, the you know, want to abandon the origin. And by seeing you can abandon the origin, you will see that you can see suffering. So the origin ought to, to be taught first, right? You should actually teach the origin first, and then you can understand what suffering really is and how you can cease it. And furthermore, seeing that you can abandon the origin hinges upon realizing selflessness. This is a very important topic, a very important point here, right? So it said that you understand first uh, that you want to abandon suffering. With the origin, you you realize that you can abandon it. This is, is, is explicitly taught in the sutras. Then with the cessation, you realize you want to be free. You realize you want to have that cessation. So if you realize you want, you can abandon suffering, you should have you should realize that that the origin of suffering, which is ultimately traces back to the wrong view of the person, is a wrong view. So you realize selfless selflessness. So therefore, you should have you should understand the path, which is the realization of selflessness. So the path ought to be taught even before the origin. So Galtzev J responds again with this idea that it really has to do with the stages in which you train your mind to initiate any project. You must first see a benefit in doing so and a drawback in not doing so. So first, you contemplate the general and specific sufferings of samsara. And you see it as like a pit of fire. You generate a mere wish to be free of that. So mere, right? You don't understand the full scope of it. We just talked about that. You just, what you can see, you're half, you're not happy. You're the opposite of happy, but you're happy just to be free of that. So you you want to, uh, you, the, uh, the degree that you understand suffering motivates you to, to then go further into it, into understanding. And you don't, know that you don't have to know that you can be yet. So next you ascertain with valid cognition that you can abandon the origin. How? Because you realize selflessness. You realize that the origin, which is ultimately based on the wrong view of the self, is a wrong engager, and thereby it must be a, must be a counter to it, a, a way to counteract it. Doesn't necessarily mean you realize the path. There's a bit of a difference. You don't realize the direct perception, that you can have a direct valid, uh, direct yogic perception of uh, of selflessness, you also don't realize all the different uh, uh, components that go into the path and all the stages. You're just realizing in a general sense. So with that, you see that you can actualize cessation. You can start to see that, well, if this was gone, there must be something different. That's This isn't the fundamental nature of the mind. This wrong view can't actually, it doesn't engage things as they are, so that's not how the mind really is. Is understood that the mind itself is not necessarily right or wrong. So this wrong view is adventitious to the mind. And finally, you see that actualizing cessation hinges upon meditating on the path. So you start to see that there's many stages to that path. 
So then Gelsab J says, the order that the path arise of seeing arises in a yogi's mind is the same. So that's what we say in the path of seeing, you have these stages according to the truth of suffering and so forth in the in the four stage order. Uh, so then another answer is this is from Kedrib J. Right. So then we had this earlier thing uh, I mentioned, we have to be very precise about looking at things. And we see that it says when you contemplate on suffering, you contemplate on the general and specific sufferings of samsara. But the general sufferings is generally going to be things like the six sufferings, right? That uh, things are uncertain, they are uh, unsatisfactory, the suffering of being born again and again, uh, of giving up your body again and again, of going from high to low and being without a friend. Those are the six sufferings, right? So those are general to all of samsara. And the specific sufferings is going to be things like the sufferings of the six realms and so forth. Uh, so, but then we say, if, if that's the case, if general suffering, right? So what is the general qualities of suffering? So there's this quotation from KJB J is Dispelling Mental Darkness. This is the book that Geshe Namdak and Geshe Lexok, they put out that book a couple of years ago. What is it called? Uh, Freedom Through Correct Understanding or what, something like that. <laughs> Sorry, I should know. Uh, but um, anyway, that's just a translation of parts of this book by K. J. J. Dispelling Mental Darkness. So he says, to generate a fully characterized mind of disgust for samsara, samsara in general, one must realize pervasive compositional suffering. Without needing to meditate on the other two suffering, other two sufferings as suffering, most beings can establish them as in the nature of suffering by their own experience, right? So just knowing that the suffering of suffering and even the suffering of change is not that profound, right? But merely that cannot gener directly induce disgust with samsara in general, right? So this is the point. If you want to have a general understa uh, understanding of the general suffering of samsara, he's saying it's more than just thinking about suffering in a general sense. It's talking about this pervasive compounded suffering that is general, that pervades samsara. So otherwise, in the continuum of hell beings and so on, a mind of disgust for samsara in general would effortlessly arise. Effortlessly, effortlessly arise. It would pervade that it always does, because they always recognize that they're suffering. They're not happy with their situation. So he concludes, you need to meditate on these very appropriating aggregates, right? Understand that your aggregates themselves are in the nature of suffering. So this is just another point to show that there's no clear answer, right? Somebody else could come back and debate and say this whole idea that you first recognize the, sp the general sufferings of samsara, and then you come to understand it more subtly later, well, then somebody could have an opposite opinion and, and give this quotation here. I'm not going to come up here with a, with a conclusion. I'm just going to leave a lot of these points. I think we'd have to go on for a very long time, if ever, to come to some kind of conclusion about this. And then finally, we have Sankapa. This is another text, very similar text to the first one that I mentioned earlier. Semei uh, Jejong, what is it? Uh, dispelling forgetfulness in relation to valid cognition. So he call, talks about the order of wishes and realizations. So this is a, often how it's understood. It's not literally you first understand suffering and then understand the origin, but you understand, you first understand that uh, suffering in terms of knowing, right? You recognize that it's suffering and then you wish to abandon the origin. And so first seeing the faults of suffering, one wishes to be free of it. It's the faults you're seeing. It's not, you're not seeing the full extent of it. And second, finding the origin to be the cause, one wishes to abandon it. So that wish is what comes second. It doesn't necessarily mean the realization comes second. Third, realizing that one can abandon it, one sees that it is possible to attain actualized cessation. Now, is that the same thing? Is wishing to abandon the truth of suffering and the truth of the origin the same as wishing to achieve nirvana? Probably not. Uh, that's another point that is debated. And it's, it is a, there's a quotation from the Lamrim that makes it pretty clear he's saying it's not. Uh, one of the problems with that would be that we generally say that a Mahayana practitioner can directly enter the Mahayana path without have to, having to first enter the, enter the Hinayana path. However, in order to first enter the Mahayana path, definitely one has to wish to be free of suffering before that. Uh, as it says in... Uh, Many texts, for example, in uh, Bodhisattva Charya Vatara, right? Semshen dera dilangon rangi donda dendawe sem milam doya mamina shengi donda kala ke. Right. So 
Milam, uh, if uh, before meditating on suffering in terms of my own suffering, uh, I don't even in a dream have the wish to be free of it, then how can I possibly uh, wish to be wish other beings to be free of it? Right? So how, and there's a very similar thing at the end of the second chapter of Chandrakirti's co uh, commentary on the 400 stanzas. Those are the two main places where we see that in the Indian texts. So um, it's saying that uh, you, you have to first wish to be free yourself of this suffering, right? But if that's the case, then if wishing to be free of suffering was the same as wishing to attain liberation, then you'd already be on the Hinayana path. Now you could argue that it's not uncontrived, but that's very problematic. So if you'd first generate a contrived wish to be free of suffering, and then you directly generate the wish to achieve enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings, that's uncontrived. At that very moment, you also necessarily have to have an uncontrived wish to be free of suffering yourself, because now you are on a path. You have to have renunciation, which is uncontrived. So what reason would that have to arise then? What? Why would wishing to achieve full enlightenment also, the meditating on the wish to do that for all sentient beings also necessitate suddenly having this uh, wish to be free of all suffering yourself. Now, some people do argue that for various reasons, but it's problematic uh, as uh, for the reason I just mentioned. And so one other way to see it is that it's a different thing, right? You can want to be free of suffering, but you haven't actually decided, I'm going to go there and follow this path to that kind of liberation. You can just see this as this is not a desirable state. I haven't yet decided where I'm going to go. Maybe there's two ways out. I haven't decided which way I'm going to go yet. But I know I don't want to be here. So then we say, finally, one sees that the specific nature of the stages of the path leading to that cessation and wishes to rely on that path. So the specific nature of the stages, right? As opposed to just knowing selflessness, you you, uh, know, you know, relying on the path is a lot more than that. It, it actually requires understanding all the different points of what it what it is to follow the Buddhist path. Okay, so yeah, that's, then we have the 16 aspects and 16 wrong engagers, which I said is the other major point. So we'll leave that for next time. And uh, then the other minor debates we'll have next time. So uh, why don't we stop here and we have time for question and answer. Hey, Manabal Gajan, can you hear me? Yes. All right. So I have a question, actually, also from the last week of our studies that I feel I'm not uh, convinced. Maybe you can help me with that. Um, so you said that if we are doing an act that is negative out of our ignorance, mm -hmm. then we create a negative karma, no? Yeah, basically, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Buddhas, even if they are wrathful, they have complete control over everything and they know everything and they see everything. So, even they are wrathful, they know exactly what they do and why they do it. So, there is nothing negative that is being created, right? Yes. Okay. Now, we were talking about uh, the fact that when you did not abandon the knowledge of obscuration, even of even though you are an our heart, um, one of the things that uh, uh, can happen because of that that you can behave like a monkey because of the habits, or yeah. you can act in anger because of the habits, even though you don't have anger. No. no, anger. No, you can not anger. You can. I'm sorry, I'm rephrasing. You can yeah. uh, have harsh, harsh, harsh speech. speech. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, not from intention, because it comes from a habit, because of the knowledge of situation yeah, yeah, yeah. in the band and before. Right. Mm -hmm. If you have a harsh speech and someone is being affected negatively by that, mm -hmm. how could that be? Because um, you didn't control it. It's not something that was intentionally. How could that not create a negative karma? I have really, really a uh, strong problem with this because you hurt someone out of your control. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, that person had the karma to be hurt, of course, because we are interdependent, but you also hurt that person. How mm-hmm. can that not create a negative karma? I mean, I had someone also, in a way, debating with me on the fact that in a certain point, for instance, when you get liberated, so uh, it doesn't matter what you do because you don't have the intention. So you you can hurt other people unintentionally, but you still don't create a negative karma. So mm-hmm. I'm having quite difficulties with this. Mm-hmm. If you can maybe help me understand, because it seems okay. to the cause of uh, like to the law and cause and effect uh, rules. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a d- deep question. It's a difficult question. And I can give you an answer from the text, whether it's going to be satisfying or not, I'm not sure. One answer I would just that comes to mind is would you say that it, you know, for example, when the Buddha was debating with the Jains during his lifetime, right? The Jains were arguing that if you step on an insect, even if you didn't mean to do so, it's the same as whether you meant to do so or not, you still are creating the same negative karma. And the Buddha argued it actually has to do with your intention. Right. So would you say that if if you accidentally, st- although you're trying very c- carefully not to step on any insects, and you accidentally step on one, do you think that you're creating negative karma by doing so? Not a complete karma, but... But a karma. Yes. Okay. Not complete, for yeah. sure. Okay. And if the Buddha does, does, does the Buddha create karma? But then we said, the Buddha, everything that he does, he does out of controlling over him his mind. Out of control, right. Exactly, okay. because he... He, he doesn't have the knowledge of curation. He doesn't do things that are coming from uh, uh, the residue of an imprint that, can, like, you know, mm-hmm. as what was being mentioned. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, what about another question then? What if, um, you know, what if this uh, arhat, you know, by seeing this person, somebody else generates affliction and creates negative karma? Does the arhat generate negative karma from being the catalyst for that? It's also an interesting question, isn't it? For instance, we thought of a case yeah. that when arhat is supposed to be a teacher or whatever, and then he behaves like a monkey. Well, no, not that he's behaving like a monkey, right? But like, for example, there's a story. It's actually kind of ironic that it's similar. It's not meant to be similar, but there's a story of Mahakachana, right? Who is one of the students of the Buddha, an arhat. And this has nothing to do with anything he did, right? He was a very good-looking man, and he was uh, walking down off the mountain one day and is shining in the sunlight, and for some reason, a a rich man looked at him and says, wow, he looks just like a monkey. Now, it's not because he was doing anything wrong. Uh, I'm not sure why he looked like a monkey, but the Buddha said that uh, that that man who said that will be born as a monkey as a result of saying that. Right. And the story goes, just this is kind of irrelevant, but it's interesting that this very rich man who was too proud to 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 apologize. So what he did was because the Buddha said he was going to be born in this particular place, in this park. So he re- renovated the park. So at least when he was born there, it was a little nicer. But anyway, the point is uh Mahakachana didn't do anything at all. All he was all it was was that somebody else had an affliction by seeing him. Well, he right? didn't it was just his presence there. Um, he didn't do anything. I'm talking about the one that does. Right. Okay. It's, this is but nevertheless, this is the problem, he was, he was born into a human body. Right. He was born into a human body. And by being here in this world, his presence, you know, was was causing others to to suffer. Which is kind of the nature of having an afflicted afflicted aggregates, a contaminated aggregates. So like, whereas we, we're taking on these contaminated aggregates and we just can't help it. It's just the nature of them that they that they malfunction and, and say bad things and act like a monkey, you know, because you don't have, they're just, they're, they're under the power of their own, their own trajectory from past actions, right? So you ha- you've accumulated this past action uh, that then is propelling you to this, this speech, even though you're, you don't want to do it because you're not in control of this stream. But this is exactly where my point is. Mm-hmm. When when these things comes out of lack mm-hmm. of controlling, I'm not talking about the Buddha. I'm mm-hmm. talking about the fact that we say, even in a gross level, we say mm-hmm. that we create karma from ignorance, not mm-hmm. being able to control our mind, habits, whatever. 
But then when my problem lies is when it comes from, you know, it doesn't matter if it's gross or subtle in the regard of the fact that we still do something out of lack of control. So if, mm-hmm. if we do something negative out of lack of control, then isn't it the thing that creates negative karma? It doesn't well, like really. I mean, the main thing that creates negative complete, karma is the intention, right? That's why, this like, it's the very beginning where... of the fourth chapter of of uh, of Abhidhamma Kosha. That's what I said. I'll give you the answer from the text, right? So, lele jikten that's okay. Dini sempa tang de che sempa higi leyano, right? So, from the various from karma varied worlds arise. Uh, uh, this is intention, and then the actions that it produces. So, the intention is the mental karma. The actions are the are the body and speech. So the intention is the key. And the Buddha also said, right? So Shonam Yigi Rangjin Day, Yigi Rangjin, Yigi Song and Ladro. Right. So the the every all things are the nature of the mind, not in the Chittamatra sense, but uh the mind is chief, all things follow after it. Right. So what really makes a, an action positive or negative is the mental state impelling it. Uh so if there's no mental intention whatsoever. Uh, it's very questionable how it can be a, a truly negative action. Now, what you're saying is a very good point, and that is a debatable point. But anyway, the uh, in terms of the traditional presentation, right? The idea is going to be that it it although there, of course, there is some negative uh, negativity in the process. There's nothing behind it. There's no person acting and thinking, "I'm going to do this." It, it's just simply part of a stream that they're no longer, in some sense, connected to. They've detached from that. So they're not going to experience any kind of result. It's just kind of that stream is going to exhaust itself. They're they're they've they've got they've kind of abandoned ship and the ship is still floating and doing whatever it's doing, but they're not connected with it anymore. Yeah, um it's really it's contradicting. Yeah. I know it's a different the things that I studied. I mean, it's like I'm yeah. I'm I'm really puzzled. It seems like the 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 the, the law of cause and effect uh, mm-hmm. doesn't go along with this. I mean, mm-hmm. if we say that everything that you do that is negative, when your mind is not underneath control of everything, including the the subtle um, afflictions, then this is it just seems to be well, subtle afflictions, right? The person doesn't have subtle afflictions. Well, right. knowledge of creation, let's just say the money is not right, but it's different, right? They have lack of control. It's very different than having, you know, unconscious intention to do something. Okay, okay. Out of the fact that there is some residue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. Anyway, I I just feel that uh, I'm not satisfied. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, the... I I I said I told you. No, I know, I know, I know. I know. I'm satisfy you. I'll give exactly. you the what we what we would say from a traditional standpoint, but it is. Uh, you know, so I think, you know, we we want if in terms of a debate, we'd want to structure it very precisely. Like, so what is, you know, so we say what what is the co- what is the specific thing that is considered the cause here? That and then and what is the result of it? Right. So, okay. So every result has a cause, right? But what you know, for example, um, you know, hair growing on my head is going to have some kind of cause. That doesn't necessarily mean that it has anything to do. With my own future experience in samsara, right? So where, where you know, we have to identify specifically where is the cause in relation to uh, the person's experience. Now, I just I think we should probably leave it because other people have questions. But yeah, this is it's a very good point to debate and then try to be very precise about you know what is the question and then how what would be the the doubt that's left there and then how what would be a way to to answer it. Now I'm uh, you know kind of weaseling my way out of it here because uh, we have to move on but uh yeah that's why usually a debate can go on for for hours it's not it's not necessarily true that there's one obvious clear answer to it um venerable hello i have yes hello uh well depending on the the time what time do we finish i have a comment. it's okay well i said i mean unless everyone else wants to go i said we started 10 minutes late so i may as well go 10 minutes longer here. I think that's okay. Um, yeah, so my comment was with just a, a comment or a thought is re- with regard to the slide on karma, where you say, yeah. I can't remember what you said, um, is karma subtle and profound or something like that, or yeah. uh, hidden? Very hidden. Right. Yeah. Um, so um, 
I wondered if it's helpful in that context to distinguish between the general characteristics of karma, because Lama Tsongkhapa and Lam Chin Lamrim Chenmo talks about the general characteristics and how we must develop valid cognitive faith of conviction, sorry, with respect to the general characteristics. But the citation that you showed that whoever has that position, that's from Precious Garland, and that is referring to extremely hidden phenomena. And the reason I make this distinction between the specifics, like that one in Precious Garland, and then the general characteristic is that, and I, I think you alluded to this, if we otherwise we don't have any basis. Lama Tsongkhapa in the Tantra Len Rin Chemo is actually mm -hmm. almost wrathful in saying you have to generate refuge born out of conviction. And if you say, oh, mm -hmm. this is all just, he actually says, if you complain, this is too difficult for me to realize, which many of us do. But he says, if you say this is too difficult to realize, you are saying you have a faulty refuge, a defective refuge. Mm -hmm. And so he's always exhorting us to to have faith of conviction. So it, it's not very satisfactory to me at all if we say, well, karma is just too hidden. So perhaps if we distinguish in that way, we solve some of our problem. That was the first thought I had. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, this second question, um, I, I'd like to go back to the definition of samsara. Um, I was quite surprised by that. And um, if I remember, the, the, the one that was objected to was defining samsara as circling because mm -hmm. you would equate circling with the circler. Mm -hmm. And there was a verse from Fundamental Wisdom cited in support of that. Mm -hmm. And I would cite... Yes chapter two of fundamental wisdom that says movement and mover are not the same. Mm -hmm. So I okay. don't see the, can you walk us through that? I don't see a problem with broadly defining samsara as the condition of circling. It's quite nice. It's well, sort of I, I think I mentioned the point at that time that there was an issue of the, the way the Tibetan reads, right? So it doesn't say condition, right? The word in Tibetan is this yang neyani korowa, or Yanayanu, you know, uh, so the, 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 in Tibetan, the word kor, korowa, mm -hmm. in that sense, right, cycling, it can also mean a person, right, mm -hmm. the, the, like dugnel wa, we had, we said before, the natus, nature of suffering, and I said it was like suffering-ness, this wa sound, at the end of the term, at the end of the, end of the word, it can, just, it can indicate both a state of something and a person who's doing an action. So okay. in Tibetan, a person could be korwa, in the sense of the one who is cycling, and right. the state of cycling could also be korwa, the cycling. So it doesn't quite carry over into English this ambiguity. Okay, but yeah. if we so then if we separate the korwa that is person and the korwa that is just circling, then there isn't a problem, right? Well, also if we just say if we try to make it more specific and say that samsara is the condition of cycling in the sense of this abstract condition, then mm -hmm. we'd say it follows that your body is not samsara because it is not the condition of suffering. It's a condition of cycling. It's a thing that's cycling. The condition is an abstraction. Mm -hmm. right? it's, so then it, it's like, well, how does that, how does that pervade all of the different individual components of it? Yes, that's fair. I just find the true suffering in someone's continuum. It, it it's less, um, I don't know. It, it gives me less color and flavor, but yes. Well, I'm... as I said at the time, it, it's more of a technicality. Yeah. It, it is. It's not something that some couple would say in the long run because it's not really something that you use in your meditation. You say it's all the true suffering in the person's continuum except for the person. It's sort of, it doesn't, yeah, as you say, it doesn't have much flavor, but it's if you want to be very precise in your definition and saying, identify which objects of, of a group are samsara, which are not, you can very easily separate this is samsara, this is not. You have a very precise definition. In that case, you give uh, give you five things. You have uh, a, a pot, you have a person's nose, you have a person's uh, mental consciousness, you have a person, uh, and you have the object of contemplation uh, and the mind of that person. Which of those objects of are, are, are samsara and which are not? 
And then you can very easily distinguish which one is and which is not if you have a very precise definition. That makes sense, right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, hello, Um hello. I have a question about um so to to generate well oh, in, in the context of the four truths here that you would generate a mere wish to be free on the basis of understanding general and, and um general general sufferings, I think you said of samsara. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so today in class we were talking about uh, dull and sharp faculty. And mm. uh, like bodhisattvas, and I always wonder, like, the explanation is that the sharp faculties, they understand that it is possible to attain, they have a valid cognition or that it's possible, and then they generate a, the, 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 the wish to uh, follow that path. I mean, it's not exactly the same topic, but the idea is the same. Um, I wonder how that's possible. So here, if you have to say that they just do it on the basis of um, it seems to be a more vague understanding, not really 100% valid. So is it possible to have a sharp faculty person? That's a very good point, actually. And some people say, and I find this hard to take, but some people say that somebody can't possibly have this sharp faculty approach until they've meditated for quite a while on the stages of the path. And so... Necess by necessity, when somebody is first contemplating on the truth of suffering, they're not a sharp faculty person in this context. That only comes from further meditation. Otherwise, th there's a lot of, I don't know, I think you maybe you saw there was that debate that, again, Lexok and I posted some years ago. I was debating that point about it seems to be a um, kind of an endless loop that if a, sh a, a sharp faculty person they can't uh, go for refuge until they ascertain the, the qualities of the refuge by realizing emptiness, because you have to ascertain the truth, the, the Dharma refuge, and that before you ascertain the Buddha refuge, and to ascertain the Dharma refuge, you have to ascertain the truth of the path and the truth of cessation. That, of course, you have to realize emptiness for that. But then if they can't do, they can't, uh, take they can't go for refuge until they realize emptiness, then that means that they have to first, you know, go through a, a large accumulation of merit and a continuous study and all of these things without ever actually going for refuge, without actually even being Buddhist. So then you basically have to say that they realize emptiness before they're even Buddhist. And maybe you'd say that, but certainly that that's not what the tradition usually holds. Um, and it does seem to be a bit problematic. Why would they spend all these? Because it's not something that you just do as a hobby. Why would they just spend years and years trying to realize emptiness if they don't really even, you know, have any sense of refuge in the Buddha? Um, and then likewise with the meditation on suffering. Why are they going to spend their whole life practically trying to realize emptiness if they're just curious about whether the truth of suffering is true or not? Um, so there's different ways to get out of that. And one is to say that at the beginning, people don't approach the spiritual path that way. That only comes through training. Another way would be to say that even for somebody of that, of that level of mind, they can also approach things in different ways. They, they can approach through doubt is often how it's presented. So they, they don't, they come, they hear about the truth of suffering and they don't say, okay, this is true or not, but they say, this sounds intriguing and it would be worth examining. And I think that's a very much in a, a quality that a, a sharp faculty person has to cultivate, which is something that's often emphasized in science as well, which is the ability to uh, hold opposing uh, opposing ideas in mind and not settle on one. Right. So the ability to not really have a firm decision, I believe this or that, and to be comfortable with that, to be comfortable with uncertainty. Um, and be willing for a long period of time to do to, to remain in that in that doubt, um, but in a doubt in a positive sense that that motivates you. You're interested. You think this really matters, so it, it's important to actually find out. And I'm not going to just settle on simply ignoring it either. So I, 
you want to take the time uh, uh, to do so. And in that sense, certainly you can, you can start to see you, you, although you don't know for sure, you might say that, uh, you don't know for sure that all of this suffering comes from karma and affliction in the, in the sense that the 12 links describe it, but you can see certainly quite a bit of the suffering and you can see that, uh, there's, uh, uh, that that ordinary experience of you, most per, most human beings of most sentient beings is not something terribly desirable when you really get down and think about it. Um, so, you know that that kind of leads you to a state of well, what's left, right? Uh, I think that's an ideal way to approach a path. Is that you know this is what often is described in at Sarah that. The more you're, the longer you're here, the the less certain that you become about these things, uh, and the more it all becomes just one big question. Um, but the more intensely you want to know the answer, it's not that you just become very, uh, you know, kind of cynical over time, and uninterested. Uh, you, you know, you start to see very clearly that you really want to know because suffering is clearly not something desirable. And there's there's hints about what how to get out of it and what is the cause. So you're willing to kind of follow those leads, uh, even if you haven't totally generated a, a valid cognizer ascertaining something. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think so, is somebody is trying to speak. Your microphone is not on. You're, you're muted. No, we're just um, sort of looking at each oh. other, checking if there are more questions. Okay, okay. That was very insightful. Okay. Thank you so much, Venerable Gache. Um, I'm thanking you on behalf of all of us who are studying, you know, here. Um, it's really interesting. And thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge so generously and answering our questions um very kindly and when with yes with precision and patience so thank you so much we're very grateful it's been a really interesting talk and um yeah we look forward to delving into more depth next time as well but thank you for the great food for thought we've really appreciated it and i've been keeping track of some of the comments as well and people are really grateful so thank you so much very kind okay. thank, you. Yeah. thank you all yeah i was very happy to have the opportunity to read over these points again. And uh, yeah, we have the other second half of the presentation already prepared. So next time, just we'll figure out the date and we can continue with that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And so we'll meet again for the second installment. Okay. Very good, so, thank you. Good night or good afternoon to all of you. <laughs> good night, Venerable. Thank you.